You know, I remember some years ago when uh, one of my daughters was going to school up in uh, Erie, and uh, we we went up there and, and spent uh, some time over a weekend there, and we went to a... Uh, Actually, for some reason, I ended up going by myself to uh, church on Sunday morning, a very large uh, evangelical-type church, and I parked in the parking lot and, and got there early because I wasn't quite sure how long it would take me to get there, and got there, and people were coming in, and I noticed absolutely nobody had a Bible as they walked in. I walked in with a Bible. I felt kind of strange, you know, I, I, I'm not out of place because the Bible is a good thing to bring here. Please feel very free to be able to bring a Bible, your own Bible, to mark in it, to mark in the person's Bible next to you if you don't like to write in yours, the notes that you need about about the message. But it, it, it's kind of strange, and it speaks of a, a famine in the land. You know, the Bible speaks about there being a famine in the land when Abraham was in the land and he ended up going down to Egypt uh, in order to escape that famine. And symbolically, that was very bad. The idea of going down and going down to Egypt, the place of eventual bondage of the children of Israel. And he went because there was a famine. Well, there's a famine in our land of the Word of God. There's a famine in the knowledge of the Word of God among not just this nation, but among believers in Jesus Christ. And it's one of the reasons that, that many people are targets and sometimes easy targets for cults or for being diverted from righteous behavior simply because they don't know. They don't know. I never read. The, the Bible says that? Really? The Bible tells me how I ought to live in a marriage relationship down to very detailed stuff about uh, the relationship between husband and wife and parents and children. The Bible really speaks about my, my attitude and behaviors as, as a person in the community, as a contributor to the community, in my job, in my workplace. It really does. Yes, it really does. And that's why on Sunday mornings at this point in the service... This is what we do is we open this book. And I hope that this isn't the only time that you break open this book. Because if it is, then you're on life support. You've got a feeding tube being given to you. And you're being force-fed the good things from this. But my prayer is that what we do here on Sunday mornings gives you a taste, enough of a taste, that... When you go home Sunday afternoon, you go, was Pastor Kevin really saying that was in the Bible? I better check that out. Or Monday morning, getting up and saying, you know what? I want to start my day off right. I'm going to eat something. I'm not talking about Cheerios. I'm not talking about bacon and eggs. I'm talking about the Word of God. It is life. It is what God has given us as instruction for righteousness so that the Bible says that we have this so that the man of God might be complete. Complete. Do you ever feel like there's something missing in your faith? Do you ever feel like there's something missing in your walk with the Lord? I'm here to tell you this morning that maybe it's this. Maybe it's this. So if you found your way to Isaiah, we're going to start, we're going to look at chapters 11 and 12, but we're going to do it backwards. We're going to start with chapter 12. Chapter 12 of the book of Isaiah. And in my Bible, it's not part of the original text, but they put headings over some of the, some of the chapters and some of the sections of chapters. This one, it, it says, a hymn of praise, a hymn of praise. That's yeah, a pretty good title for it. Because listen to what Isaiah says to us. In that day you will say, O Lord, I will praise you. Though you were angry with me, your anger is turned away and you comfort me. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. 
For Yah the Lord is my strength and song. He also has become my salvation. Therefore, with joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. And in that day you will say, Praise the Lord, call upon His name, declare His deeds among the peoples, make mention that His name is exalted. Sing to the Lord, for He's done excellent things. This is known in all the earth. Cry out, shout, O inhabitant of Zion, for great is the Holy One of Israel in your midst. Did you ever go to a concert and at the end of a particular piece there's scattered applause? It's like people aren't really all that impressed. They really didn't like it. Or perhaps it's an inappropriate place and they shouldn't be applauding. I learned that in my freshman year of college. One of the first times I went on my own without instruction to a uh, string quartet presentation and I didn't know you weren't supposed to applaud every time they stopped but you're supposed to wait until all three parts of the piece are over. Over. So I was enjoying it, and I was up in the balcony, and they came to the end of the first movement or whatever it's called, and I... <laughs> was the only one. But it usually means that, well, there isn't that much excitement. But then have you ever been to a concert where it's like... The people don't want to stop applauding, don't want to stop cheering, don't want to stop just with exuberance. That's kind of the feel of the description of this day, isn't it? Whoa, rejoice, praise, sing out. Wow, it's great. All this stuff. And I'm thinking, man, I want to be there. Which, which day are you talking about there? O oh Lord, I will praise you, verse 1 says. Though you were angry with me, your anger is turned away and you comfort me. In the context of the book of Isaiah that we're talking about, the nation of Israel, both the northern half and the southern half, were being chastised because of their behavior because of their ungodly behavior. And God had laid out to them precisely, here's the judgment that's going to come because of your poor behavior. Here it's coming. And we're going to see in chapter 11 some hope. And then he speaks about this future day when you will say, God, you were angry with me, but now you're comforting me. It's an interesting thing here in the words angry and comfort in the Hebrew language here. The word for angry, or that's translated angry here for us, and I'm not going to try and pronounce the word because it, um, if anybody knew Hebrew, as some among us do, um, they would know that I don't know how to pronounce Hebrew. But the word literally means to breathe hard and has come to mean to be angry. I know exactly what this is. Krista and I have been married for 31 wonderful years. And she has pointed out to me that I express myself sometimes by my breathing. I don't say anything, but something will happen. And she goes, why are you so mad? I'm not mad. Yeah, you are. No, I'm not. And then I get mad about the fact that she's saying I'm mad and I don't think I'm mad. I didn't say anything, but I did this. <sighs> you know? <sighs> Sometimes it has a little oomph to it. You know? That's the, that's the idea of where this word came from and how it came to be developed into the idea of being angry. It says, Lord, you were <sighs> with us. But now... You comfort us. And that word actually comes from a word talking about breath as well, but it actually means a sigh. Oh. God has gone from oh, to... Oh. That's how a person hearing this in the original language and original context would hear it. It's a very personal thing. It's a very personal thing when you're close enough to someone to hear them 
exhale in a way that you go, oh, wow, they're mad. Or, oh, they're comforting me. And that's what God is saying. Isaiah, speaking God's word, says, the day is coming when you will say, God, you were angry with me, but not anymore. Because at this point in time, he is angry with them. Because for hundreds of years, they've been ignoring him. Then he says, Behold! In the old King James, it's translated, Lo! Or I was looking in one of my books and it said, Lo! Exclamation point. And I thought it was L-O-L. And I thought, Really? That's what that means? I had no idea they texted back in those days. Behold. It's a declaration. Hey! Look! That's what that word means. And look at what he says. God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For Yah the Lord is my strength and song and has become my salvation. Now I find that really interesting. God is my salvation. The word salvation here means to remove someone from a burden, oppression, or danger. To remove someone from a burden, oppression, or or danger. Now we as believers in Jesus Christ on this side of Calvary talk about salvation, salvation through Jesus Christ. There is no other name whereby a man can be saved. It is through Jesus Christ alone. I'm saved. Are you saved? Do you want to get saved? I can tell you how to get saved. And we think of salvation in those terms, very theological, very, I'm forgiven of my sin. And now I am a new person from the inside out. All of that would not be what the person hearing this from Isaiah would be thinking of because they're on the front side of Calvary. They don't see that personal, individual salvation. They thought of salvation in terms of being delivered from an enemy, being saved from an enemy, being saved from the burden of an unrighteous king or government. And that's how they would be thinking of it. Oh, you saved me from some burden, from some oppression. Now, Salvation for us in Jesus Christ means all of that as well, doesn't it? So it's a very full word. But here's what I want you to think about. He said, the writer says, He is my strength and my song and has become my salvation. You know, a lot of times when we are feeling oppressed, we are feeling burdened, we're feeling in danger in some way in our lives. And we are looking for help from the Lord. And He strengthens us, doesn't He? He strengthens us to be able to stand in the midst of this difficult time. To Okay, He's, he's given me the strength to go through this. The, the issue is not resolved. The situation is I still am in danger. I'm still burdened. But man, I, I'm strong enough that you know I'm going to go through. He he is my strength, he says. He is my song. That you know what? Even in the midst of this, man, I can find some joy. I can find some things in the midst of this that give me joy. And then, then, he becomes my salvation. You see, a lot of times when we pray for help in situations, we're kind of kicking back and going, okay, Lord. Bad situation. I'm burdened. I'm oppressed. I'm in danger. Deliver me. Let me know when it's done. And we wait for something to happen. What I see here is God calling upon us to step out in faith, to trust Him, and to trust Him in a way that says, you know what? I'm finding strength in this situation from the Lord. Sometimes we we give ourselves credit for strength. Man, this is a difficult situation. Oh, man. It's a good thing I'm so strong in this. Yeah, I found out how to go through it somehow, but I'm doing it. And we give ourselves the credit for it. Now, we need to look and see that in the places where we are facing obstacles, it is God who is giving us strength and to acknowledge that and thank him and praise him for it. And in seeing that, in seeking and finding that strength, 
The next thing that comes is joy. In the midst of sorrow comes joy. The, the Bible says that weeping only lasts the night. Joy comes in the morning. Paul and Silas went to Philippi. And they preached there. There weren't enough Jews for there to be a synagogue, but there were some, there were some women and some other people who would go, and they would go next to a river, which was a typical tradition that if you couldn't go into a synagogue, you would go someplace where there is living water. That's what a river or stream is. That's what the term living water means. It's not just in a pool. It's moving. There's life to it. And so they would go, and they would gather by the river there in Philippi on the Sabbath, and they would worship God. So they went with them a couple times, and they started teaching teaching them and so forth, met a lady named Lydia who sold uh, dye and so forth, and they're preaching to them. It's going pretty well. But as they're going here and there and so forth, there's this woman who is possessed of a demon. And she worked for a couple of guys prophesying and fortune-telling, and they got all the money. And, man, it was a good deal. It's a good gig for these guys. And they're using this woman who was tortured and tormented by a demon, but, you know, that's that's what they're doing. And as they're going by, this woman keeps pointing out to Paul and Silas, they're going, hey, these guys right here, they're servants of the Most High God. But everybody in town knows that she's a possessed, demon-possessed woman. And Paul and Silas are kind of like, you know, I'm a little uncomfortable with seeing an ad for my ministry in Playboy or in, you know, Rolling Stone magazine or something. You know, that's, that's kind of the way it was, as well as seeing that this woman was possessed by evil. And so finally, Paul just kind of, you get the sense of like in exasperation. She's crying this out and he turns around and goes, hey, in the name of Jesus Christ, come out of her. And the demon comes out and now she's free. And now she can't tell fortunes anymore because she no longer has that tie into the familiar spirit. And the guys who were using her to make a lot of money, they weren't real happy about this. So they got Paul and Silas thrown into jail. I believe if my memory serves me correctly, they got beaten a little bit before they went into jail. But whatever, it says they were kept in the lowest part of the jail and in stocks and in the middle of the night. You could hear them throughout the place going, Woe is me! Help me, Lord, please! I'm stuck in prison and you've forgotten about me. No. If it were... Kevin that was down there, perhaps that would be the story. But what were Paul and Silas doing? They were singing. They were singing hymns. God was their strength to be able to stand against the evil in that area. And God was their joy. He had given them a song. A song. You know, it wouldn't be a bad idea to take the bulletins every Sunday and instead of just tossing it in the in the uh, wastebasket on your way out, although if you don't want to keep it, that's a good thing to do, so we don't have to pick it up and put it in the wastebasket. But an even better thing to do would be stick it in your Bible. And during the week, when you get to those struggling places, when you get to that, that time of just, you know, gosh, I feel like I should pray and read my Bible and spend time with the Lord, but it's not happening. Grab one of those, open it up, and sing a couple of the songs that are in there. It will bring joy. And it brings a method, a way of worshiping God that will open up your Bible study time and your prayer time. God is our strength. He is our song and becomes our salvation. In the midst of that strengthening and giving joy to us, you know what? The burden is gone. The danger is gone. But you see, what we need to do is we need to come to that place of our focus is not, man, i got to keep my eyes on that burden because i got to keep away from it and Lord strengthen me to keep away from this burden so I can watch it go away. No, what the Lord says is, no, look at me. Look unto me. Look unto me. I will be your strength. I will be your song. And while you're looking at me, you know what? It's going to dissipate. It's going to evaporate. 
it's going to go away so that you will not know well what happened to that burden you know that was that was that was a burden i don't feel that burden anymore that's what the lord does you know i don't know about you this is kind of a quiet morning but that sounds pretty good to me actually that sounds real good to me it sounds so good to wendell and kevin that they're getting up and leaving because actually they're going to go out and serve you by cooking burgers and dogs for you in anticipation of some fun. I just planted a seed of hope in you that there actually will be food to eat in a little while. And that's what God is doing to the Israelites here. He has been telling them, look, you have been disobeying me and moving away from me for all of these years. Judgment is coming. As a matter of fact, I am going to take not only the ones I'm judging, but even the ones I use to judge my people, the Assyrians. I'm going to cut them down like cutting down a forest. Is the imagery that he uses. But in the midst of that, God, as is his nature, turns and says, but in the midst of trouble, there is hope. In the midst of trouble, there is hope. And that's what this chapter and chapter 11 are about. So if you flip back to chapter 11, and we'll take a look at this in two parts, the new king and the new kingdom. And remember that this is the context of this is God declaring judgment to Israel, the northern kingdom, for disobedience and injustice, to Judah, the southern kingdom, for lack of faith in God's provision, and to Assyria, the pagan country he used to bring judgment upon uh, Israel for taking that judgment too far. And as I said, at the tail end of chapter 10, he says, I'm going to cut Assyria down like I'm chopping a forest down. And then 11 verse 1. There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. His delight is in the fear of the Lord. And he shall not judge by the sight of his eyes, nor decide by the hearing of his ears, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall slay the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his loins, and faithfulness the belt of his waist. This is a description of the coming king. The coming king. Verse 1 in the New Living Translation reads this way, Out of the stump of David's family will grow a shoot. Yes, a new branch bearing fruit from the old root. There's a tree that is uh, you can find in a lot of places around Pennsylvania. It's been taking over in some areas more and more. We used to call it sumac. It's actually referred to as tree of heaven. It's actually the tree from hell. It, it comes in and it takes over an area. One of these planted itself right next to the foundation of my house and I ignorantly and stupidly did not pay attention to it. And it conveniently was right next to where two dryer vents were coming out of my house. So it was always warm and always moist there. And so it grew into an enormous tree with a stump that's this big around, literally. Had to have it uh, cut down by a professional tree cutter. I still can't get that that stump out of there, but that big stump, and after the guy cut it down, I looked at that big stump, and I'm going, oh, you can't get a stump grinder in there. It's too close to the house, and what am I going to do? And this guy said, here's what you do. Do a couple holes in that stump and pour in a mixture of oil, like motor oil, and salt. He said, that'll kill it. That'll kill the stump. Oh, okay. 
So I got out my, my drill with the long extension on it. Pour that stuff down in it and so forth. This was in, oh, it was in like maybe February or March of, of last year. By May, there were green shoots coming all out of that stump. Didn't kill it at all. I went out and got a gallon of nasty chemicals. It's the stuff you get in the little thing, Weed Be Gone. It's the active chemical in there. Only I got a gallon of it this year. I took my chainsaw. I got crisscrosses in it. I poured that entire gallon down into that thing. You know what I've seen there? Little green shoots coming up. I don't know what to do with the thing. It's like iron when I try and chop it or anything. What God has said about Assyria and Israel and Judah is I'm bringing judgment and it's going to be like the forest is cut down and there are nothing but stumps everywhere. And when Jesus came to this earth, you know, King Herod was not of the line of Judah. He was not one of the true kings of Israel. There hadn't been a true king of Israel for 600 years when Jesus came. The Davidic monarchy was a stump that looked dead as it could be. But God said, uh -uh, uh -uh. out of what you think is a dead stump, I'm going to cause life to come. In the same way that I thought I had killed and I'm still trying to kill in every way possible, that stump in my home, yet a green shoot comes out of it. And Christ in establishing his kingdom on this earth, it's been like a shoot coming out of a dead stump of the Davidic line. And Christ in you, the hope of glory, is like a tender shoot coming out of the stump of your life. You may look at certain areas of your life and it looks like a stump. It's dead. I, nothing's, nothing's happening there. God brings life. God brings life. And it says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon him. In Revelation chapter 5, it talks about the sevenfold Spirit of God or seven spirits before God, speaking of the Holy Spirit. And many look at this passage and say, this is describing the sevenfold Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the sevenfold Spirit, seven-natured Spirit of the Holy Spirit. It's interesting. Or perhaps it's just speaking about the characteristics of the Spirit. It says, The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding. Now look down at verse 3, halfway through, and this, deci this describes what this Spirit of uh, wisdom and understanding is about. Because it says, He shall not judge by the sight of his eyes, nor decide by the hearing of his ears, but with righteousness he'll judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. Wisdom and understanding. Not just wisdom in a cold understanding of things, but wisdom with understanding. Wisdom with understanding. Secondly, he says, the, the spirit of counsel and of might. Look at verse 4. It says, He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. With the breath of his lips he shall slay the wicked. But the beginning said, But with righteousness he'll judge, and he'll decide with equity. So, not just power, but power with the discretion to know when to use it. You know, there's a big political thing going on now as to whether the president of the United States was legally justified in getting us involved in Libya. And I don't want to get derailed on a political talk about anything. This has nothing to do with whether that was right or wrong. But the issue is about whether he had the authority and made the right decision. In my lifetime, every conflict that has happened 
between the United States and some other country or group of countries, there's been a debate about whether we should have been involved or not. I grew up in the Vietnam area. I grew up with protests going on. This shouldn't be happening. That shouldn't be happening. And the challenge is, ah, the president, the Congress, the military, they didn't know what they were doing. They made a poor decision. They've got the might and the power, but they didn't have what? The counsel, the discretion. That's what the people were saying. That's not what I'm saying. It's very important that someone who has might also has counsel and discretion to know when to use that might. Do you know what meekness is? It rhymes with weakness, but meekness is not weakness. Meekness is controlled strength. Jesus was meek. Was Jesus weak? Uh Uh-uh. He's God Almighty. No one more powerful than He. But in His meekness, He controlled that strength and used discretion on when He would use might and when He wouldn't. The spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord. Look at what verse 5 says. Righteousness shall be the belt of his loins and faithfulness the belt of his waist. Now, I happen to be wearing a belt. It's useful because I hang my Blackberry on it. Other than that, it really doesn't do much other than make it obvious that uh, the loop the belt loops that I have on my pants aren't just hanging out there and I forgot to wear my belt. In, in these days... The belt that a king wore was very significant. It had symbolism to it. In addition, in the style of dress that they wore, it was the belt that held everything together. He says, what will hold his garment together, the way we see him, what holds him together, what will be his belt? Righteousness and faithfulness. Knowledge and the fear of the Lord. This is the description of the new king. This is the description of Jesus. If you are a believer and a follower of Jesus Christ, this is a description of your king. Your king. He's not your bud. He's not Santa Claus. He's not your favorite uncle who can get you the things that you want. He's your king. He demands your obedience. He has the authority and power to put you in situations that require your obedience. But He chooses because of His nature to deal with us as a merciful, gracious, kind king. But make no mistake about it. He's our king. In enjoying the relationship that we have with him, where he invites us as king to enter into his throne room, to find mercy and help. In the enjoyment of that, sometimes we can kind of take for granted that, well, he's just, yeah, that's... That's Jesus. That's man. He just he's just right there and is really cool and does whatever I ask him and I just you know hang out with him when I feel like it and I call him and he comes. No, he's your king. He's your king with all authority to be that king. But he is a new king. Because he's unlike any king that has ever been on this earth. Absolute power. Absolute authority. Holds the keys to sin. Holds the keys to death and Hades. Has broken the power of sin in our lives. No king's ever done that. Some have claimed to be able to. But none have ever done it. And then what is described is the new kingdom starting in verse 6. The wolf also should dwell with the lamb, the leopard lie down with the young goat, the calf and the young lion and the fatling together. 
And a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze. Their young ones shall lie down together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play by the cobra's hole. And the weaned child shall put his hand in the viper's den. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. This is a return to the pre-fall relationship of creation. This is a return to paradise. This is what the reign of Christ will be when he comes again. We talk about the fact that there are certain animals that are natural enemies. But that's not how they were created. They weren't created to be enemies. It's the result of sin. But when sin is ultimately dealt with, then, hey, the lion and who he used to eat, they're lay down together and eat straw together. Serpents no longer a threat. I find it interesting because the serpent, of course, was more crafty than any other animal it says in the garden. And Satan used the form of a serpent to lead Adam and Eve into sin. But now we got little kids reaching into the cobra's den and into the, into the serpent's lair and just playing. Aren't they cute? Can you imagine going to, the, going to the zoo with your two-year-old and going, there they are, just, just, just jump right on in there. They're fun. They're a little slithery, but they're fun. Of course not. It's a radical transformation of the earth and of the creation. Verse 10, In that day there shall be a root of Jesse who shall stand as a banner to the people, for the Gentiles shall seek him, and his resting place or dwelling place shall be glorious. Man, I love that verse because I'm a Gentile and it says he's going to call the Gentiles, that we will be a part of that. Verse 11 and 12 talks about Jesus regathering Israel. Shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people who are left from Assyria and Egypt, Pathros, Cush, Elam, Shinar, from Hamath and the islands of the sea. He'll set up a banner for the nations and will assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. Now, a lot of different scholars have a lot of different ideas about which regathering this is. And I'm not going to wade into those waters this morning, but just want to give you the image that, it, that Isaiah is giving, giving, which is that the new king will gather his people. He will gather them rather than scattering. That's what he's been talking about for the last few chapters. God's going to scatter you to the four winds. But there will come a day when he will gather you together. And... The day could come, the day could come very soon when the churches in America could be scattered like they are in China, like they are in India, like they are in Pakistan, like they are in many other countries in the world where people can't gather together like this and declare Jesus. We would never have a sign. Of course, we don't have much of a sign right now, but we would never have a sign out in front of the building saying, we worship Jesus here because it would make us a target for persecution and for death. And we might be scattered, but the day is coming when all of God's people will be gathered. All of God's people will be gathered. Verse 13 through 16 talks about the fact that Israel will be reunited again. Isaiah was speaking during a time where for several hundred years, they were two separate nations, Israel to the north, Judah to the south. And they warred with one another on occasions. But he says, the envy of Ephraim shall depart. Ephraim is is one of the words used for the northern kingdom. And the adversaries of Judah shall be cut off. Ephraim shall not envy Judah. Judah shall not harass Ephraim. But they shall fly down upon the shoulder of the Philistines toward the west. Together they'll plunder the people of the east. They shall lay their hand on Edom and Moab. People of Ammon shall obey them. The Lord will utterly destroy the tongue of the sea of Egypt. With his mighty wind, he will shake his fist over the river and strike it in the seven streams and make men cross over dry shod. Reminders of what God did in leading them out of Egypt. Reminder of what God did in leading them into the promised land across the Jordan. Gathering them together as one. 
there will be a highway for the remnant of his people who will be left from Assyria, as it was for Israel in the day that he came up from the land of Egypt. In the midst of trouble, God brings hope of his promises. Turn to Hebrews chapter 6, and we'll close here. Hebrews chapter 6. You might say, Pastor, I know, I know about this. I know that Jesus is our King. I know there's, there's coming a day when things are going to be all taken care of. I, I know that, that there is a time when God will set up His kingdom upon this earth. I know this stuff. But what about today? What about today? Look at verse 13 in Hebrews chapter 6. For when God made a promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely blessing I will bless you, and multiplying I will multiply you. And so, after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. For men indeed swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is for them an end of all dispute. Thus God, determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of the promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus, having become high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. God promised Abraham and promised by himself that he would bless him and multiply him. And Abraham held on to that promise. Through what? Through hope. Through hope. I will stand upon this promise and hope. And he went through some difficult times in that hope. And he ended up going down to Egypt a couple of times and doing stupid things a couple of times. More than a couple. But God made the promise come to pass. And so his son Isaac was born the one who would be the forerunner of Jesus Christ. We also have a hope that was laid out before us this morning. We have a hope that has been laid out before us by the promises of Jesus Christ. That you are forgiven forever for your sin. That you have the promise of life with God forever that you have the promise that there will come a time when God will wipe every tear from your eye that there will be no more sorrow no more sickness no more death but that God will be so close to us that we don't need the sun we don't need the moon for light but his very presence will be enough light for the entire world, a new world, recreated. That's the hope that we have. And you go, Pastor, that's great, but that's, that's way out there. No, it's not. What I'm telling you, what the Scripture is telling us, what Isaiah was saying to Israel at that time, because the fulfillment of that promise to the nation did not come for over 600 years. And the ultimate fulfillment has not come yet, for it will come when Jesus establishes His kingdom on this earth. But what the writer of Hebrews says is, it's like an anchor. It's like an anchor to our soul. So that the waves that toss us to and fro in this world don't take us away from that central place. An anchor is set down strong, and it grabs hold of a foundation in the bottom of the lake or of the sea. And it keeps that boat from just being thrown here and there. But if you looked at that boat from a helicopter during a storm, you go, man, that thing's just going all over the place. But it isn't because it's tethered. It's held. 
It's not going far. It's getting tossed here and there a little bit, but it's not going far. And I'm telling you this morning, that hope, that hope of glory, Christ in you, is a promise God has made to each and every human being. That if we will follow Him, if you will believe in Him, if you will surrender your life to Him, then you have an anchor. That anchor is the hope of Christ's kingdom fully revealed on this earth. It's come. He's established it. But it has not fully vanquished the enemies. But that time is coming. And the knowledge of that is not a, oh, just I'm so heavenly minded, I'm no earthly good. No, you're no earthly good unless you are heavenly minded. You are no earthly good unless you have that anchor to your soul. You will find yourself in some other port that you don't want to be in. Let that hope be an anchor to your soul. Let it be hope that is not unfounded. It's hope that is sure and confident. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for hope. And in this life, we need hope. For Lord, we are tossed here and there. We do see ourselves burdened and surrounded by enemies at times. We do need your strength and your joy in us that you would become our salvation. Lord, that we would see you as you really are. And we would know that we have a future and a hope And that future and hope gives us confidence, gives us assurance, gives us an anchor for our lives now. Lord, help us to see this this way, that our lives would be fully tethered. For Lord, you know, because you promised us that in this world we'd have tribulation. And you also encouraged us to be of good cheer, for you have overcome the world. Thank you for that hope, Lord. Keep that hope alive in us each and every day, Lord, that we might face with confident assurance the things that would challenge our faith and hope in you. And now before I say amen, and while we're in an attitude of prayer, I want to extend an invitation to anyone here who says, I don't, I don't, I've never had that hope. I don't know that hope that you're talking about. But I recognize I need and I desire that hope. I'm talking about a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. I'm talking about coming to that place in your life of surrendering your life to the King, becoming a subject of the new kingdom. Believing on the Lord Jesus Christ and what He has done to give you new life. If you want to do that this morning and declare it publicly to this congregation of believers, I invite you right now, just stand up right where you are and we will pray together and the angels in heaven will rejoice. Is there anyone who wants to stand up today and declare Jesus Christ as their Lord? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the grace and salvation that you have poured out into the lives represented here, Lord, and the families represented here. Lord, I pray that you would keep your hope burning strongly within us. Keep that anchor firmly secured to our soul. That we might always walk in the assurance of our hope in you. And then may God richly bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you. 
May He be gracious to you and lift up His countenance upon you, granting you peace each and every day of your life. Through Jesus Christ, who is our Lord and Savior, our King, who is coming soon to establish His kingdom upon this earth. Amen and amen. God bless you.